Um, the subject of my talk today um, is a family that we don't have much in common with in some ways. Uh, the royal family in, in Russia who are the royal martyrs of Russia. Uh, because they were born as, uh, into the aristocratic families, born, you know, St. Nicholas was the son of the Tsar, uh, Alexander II. And, um, but there's many things that uh, as Christ Orthodox Christians we can relate to and they're very much like us. Um, Tsar Nicholas did not have any heirs or pretense of, uh, he, he was a very down-to-earth man who was very compassionate throughout his whole life. And um, there are many occasions, where like one, one occasion, and it's not in my talk, but it's just something that came to me is, he was with his family and there was a, a man who had a, a truck and something fell out the back of the truck and they were like in a place where there was no help. So the man went out to lift the thing back up and uh, the item back into his truck and it was too heavy. For, so the czar walked over and lifted it up and helped him. And the uh, people around him like were amazed because Russia was very much of a stratified uh, society and the aristocrats were very, very different than uh, the rest. But in, in his mind and his heart, um, Tsar Nicholas was like uh, an amazing Christian. I, I get, I don't know. So we'll, I'll continue on here. And I can, one of the aspects of his life, which I hope this doesn't sound too effective because the thing is, I, there are people that they don't understand the, the royal family. By the end of this talk, I hope you come to some understanding. So here's the prophet Job, and um, I wanted to go over his life very briefly before I um, delve into Tsar Nicholas's life. And so um, now here's the reference from the New Testament concerning Job and the principle that uh, we should be edified by. And so the epistle of St. James says, Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth and hath long patience for it until he receive the early and the latter rain. Be ye also patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. Grudge not one against the other. Brethren, lest ye be condemned. Behold, the judge standeth before the door. Take, my brethren, the prophets who have spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering, affliction, and of patience. Behold, we count them happy which endure. Ye have heard of the patience of Job, and have seen the end of the Lord. And the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. And so the story begins where there was a certain, a certain man in the land of Ossus whose name was Job. And that man was true, blameless, righteous, and godly, abstaining from everything evil. And he had seven sons and three daughters. And his cattle consisted of 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 she asses in the pasture, and a very great household. Then he had a great husbandry on the earth. And it mentions about how careful he was, even though he was a rich man. He said, and his sons of visiting one another prepared a banquet every day, taking with them also their sisters to eat and drink with them. And when the days of the banquet were completed, Job sent and purified them, having risen up in the morning and offered sacrifices for them according to their number, and one calf for a sin offering for their souls. For Job said, Lest peradventure my sons have thought evil in their minds against God. Thus then Job did continually. So this is an amazing example for parents where he was very much concerned about the thoughts uh, and intentions of his children. And he prayed constantly for them and he made sacrifice for them according to the Old Testament understanding. And so he was just a, uh, an amazing lofty example of a man in the married life. And it came to pass on a day that behold, the angels of the Lord came to stand before the Lord and the devil came with him. And the Lord said to the devil, Whence art thou come? And the devil answered the Lord and said, I am come from compassing the earth and walking up and down the world. And the Lord said to him, Hast thou diligently considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, a man blameless and true, godly, abstaining from everything evil 
Then the devil answered and said before the Lord, Dost Job worship the Lord for nothing? Hast thou not made a hedge about him and about his household and all his possessions round about? And hast thou not blessed the works of his hands and multiplied his cattle upon the land? Put forth thy hand and touch all that he has. Verily he will bless thee to thy face, which is sort of like he will curse thee. Then the Lord said, to the devil, Behold, I give unto thine hand all that he has, but touch not himself. So the devil went forth out from the presence of the Lord. Whoops. And so it came to pass on a certain day that Job's sons and daughters were drinking wine in the house of their elder brother. And behold, there came a messenger uh, to Job and said to him, uh, The yokes of oxen were plowing and the she-asses were feeding near them. And the spoilers came and took them for a prey and slew the servants with the sword. And I, having escaped alone, am come to tell thee. While he was yet speaking, there, was, uh, there came another messenger and said to Job, Fire hath fallen from heaven and burnt up the sheep and devoured the shepherds likewise. And having escaped alone, I am come to tell thee. While he was yet speaking, there came another messenger and said to Job, The horsemen formed three companies against us and surrounded the camels and took them for a prey and slew the servants with the sword. And I only escaped and am come to tell thee. While he was yet speaking, another messenger came, comes and, and says to Job, While thy sons and thy daughters were eating and drinking with their elder brother, suddenly a great wind came out on from the desert and caught the four corners of the house. And the house fell upon thy children, and they are dead. And I have escaped alone, and have come to tell thee. So Job arose, and rent his garments, and shaved the hair of his head, and fell on the earth, and worshipped, and said, I myself came forth naked from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. As it seemed good to the Lord, so hath it come to pass, Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all these events that befell him, Job sinned not at all before the Lord and did not impute folly to God. And so we have the worst possible things happen to Job where he loses not only his possessions, but he loses his children. And he saw all things as gifts from God, blessings from God, his children were from God, and God took them away. And he, in his very amazing and deep faith, he just trusted in God. And this is before the, the clear doctrine of our Lord's resurrection, where they had uh, a concept of you know, being united with God in the next life. But Job had just an incredible faith. And the devil answered and said to the Lord, um, okay, so actually I skipped a part where the devil went and, and uh, our, our Lord said to him, you see how Job was faithful. And so then the devil answered, said, skin for skin, all that a man has, will he give ransom for his life? Nay, put forth thy hand and touch his bones and his flesh. Verily, he will bless thee to thy face. And the Lord said to the devil, behold, I deliver him up to thee, only save his life. So the devil went out from the Lord and smote Job and with sore boils from his feet to his head. And he took a potsherd and to scrape away the discharge and sat upon a dunghill outside the city. When much time had passed, his wife said to him, How long wilt thou hold out, saying, Behold, I wait yet a little while, expecting the hope of my deliverance? For behold, thy memorial is abolished from the earth, even thy sons and daughters, the pangs and pains of my womb, which I bore in vain with sorrow. And thou thyself sittest down to spend nights in the open air among the corruption of worms. And I am a wanderer and a servant from place to place and house to house, waiting for the setting of the sun, that I may rest from my labors and my pangs, which now beset me. But say some word against the Lord and die. And so she was possessed of a... A demonic thought where they would separate herself and Job, but he replied, we all know. But Job looked on her and said to her, Thou hast spoken like one of the foolish women. If we have received good things of the hand of the Lord, shall we not endure evil things? And all these things that happened to him, Job sinned not with his lips before God. And so there's a icon from a manuscript. Uh, 
of Job and his affliction and his wife and then his friends. And so, um, Job endured. His friends, as we know, uh, accused him of some secret sin which he could not... Um, um, he couldn't find the sin within himself. And so he searched and searched, and so then he would defend himself. And um, at one point he became a little... Um, he did... He was worn down. And he asked, you know, God, why is he afflicting him? Like he accepted it, but he, did, he couldn't see any sin. And uh, there was a, th a fourth man that comes in around chapter 30-something. And um, he condemned Job's friends for falsely accusing Job. But he also told Job that he had um, false reasoning. Because God is incomprehensible and we, sh and we should never see ourselves as virtuous. And that whatever happens to us is, uh, is brought upon us according to God's inscrutable will. And um, Job accepted this. And when Job accepted this and accepted this, this providence, then God appeared to him. And it's that point where um, uh, our, our Lord says, you know, were you there when I uh, laid the foundations of the earth and uh, seas were brought forth from the bosom of the earth and all these, these various images of, you know, God being the creator. And, and Job says, I, you know, now I see that I know that I'm nothing but corruption, earth and ashes. And that's actually what Abraham said when he came to um, encounter God through experience, through, through a deep, deep knowledge. And so this is an example for all of us. Like we should never count ourselves as virtuous. We should never say, well, I did this or I did that. And you know, God should reward me. It's like, we're always debtors. We gain blessings from God, like our Lord himself said that, that when we do all things, we should count ourselves as profitless servants because we've only done that which is required of us. And so that's the, that's the mindset. That's the mindset of the righteous. That's where we, you know, we live our life in, you know, fear and trembling. That, you know, so there's that component of that, but there's also the component of love and then participation in the things of God. And so Job went through all this, and then and after he, his mind turned and he totally accepted everything to the depths of his soul, and he did not, you know, see himself as righteous and perhaps not deserving uh, what happened, and so then it's, it's written after Job's affliction. And the Lord prospered Job. And when, and when he prayed for his friends, he forgave them their sin, meaning the Lord forgave them their sin, and Job made a sacrifice for them. And the Lord gave Job twice as much, even double what he had before. And all his brethren and his sisters heard all that had happened to him, and they came to him, and so did all that had known him from the first, and they ate and drank with him and comforted him and wondered at all that the Lord had brought upon him. And each one gave him a lamb and four dra drachms of weight of gold, even of unstamped gold. And the Lord blessed the latter end of Job more than the beginning. And his cattle were 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, a thousand yoke of oxen, and a thousand she asses of the pasture. And so then that's a double of everything, right? But then, and there were born to him seven sons, and three daughters. So that was the original, uh, he had seven sons and three daughters who perished uh, by the God allowing the devil to tempt them. So why do you think he didn't have double? Because he does have double, because this is a intimation of the, the resurrection. In, in the next age, Job is going to have 14 sons and six daughters. So he didn't need to have the, the double uh, added to him. And so it's a testimony, like there's these subtle things in the Old Testament um, where, uh, well, the doctrine, it's, it, you know, the Old and New Testament, it's, it's the prophecy and then the, the veil gets removed. The Moses' veil is removed and then we have the fullness of the truth. And so, Job was rewarded for his patience. And we have um, Tsar Nicholas. Uh, and I want to begin with a, a prophecy 
This is from the life of Tsar Nicholas. So prophecy of St. John of Kronstadt. So quote, the last great prophet of Holy Russia, St. John of Kronstadt, who clearly foresaw the approaching catastrophe, uh, repeatedly exhorted his countrymen to repent and turn to their former piety and support the God-anointed ruler or face untold disaster both here and in the world to come. In 1905, St. John said, quote, We have a czar of righteous and pious life. God has sent a heavy cross of sufferings to him as to his chosen one and beloved child. As the seer of the destinies of God said, quote, Whom I love, those I those I reproach and punish. This is Revelations. Uh, if there is no repentance in the Russian people, the end of the world is near. God will remove from it the pious czar and send a whip to the person of impure, cruel, in the person of in, in, an impure, cruel, and self-called ruler or rulers, who will drench the whole land in blood and tears. End quote. So that's Saint John of Kronstadt. So we begin, St. Tsar Martyr Nicholas was born in St. Petersburg on May 6, 1868, the day upon which the Holy Church celebrates the memory of St. Joe of the Longsuffering. And how prophetic this turned out to be for uh, Nicholas, St. Nicholas, was destined to follow the example of this great Old Testament saint, both in circumstances and in faith. Just as the Lord allowed the patriarch Job to suffer many things, trying him in the fire of calamity to test his faith, so was Nicholas tried and tempted, but he too never yielded and remained above all a man of God. So that's uh, Tsar Nicholas as a child. So this is a, just a little quote um, from his childhood where he was, uh, his parents were away and he was an all night vigil with his grandfather, uh, Tsar Alexander the First, I think. Um, and um, and I, during the service, there was a powerful thunderstorm. Streaks of lightning flashed one after another, and it seemed as if the peals of thunder would shake even the church and the whole world to its foundation. Suddenly it became dark, and a blast of wind uh, opened the door and blew out the flame of the candles, which were lit uh, in front of the iconostas. Iconostasis. There was a long clap of thunder, louder than before, and I suddenly saw a fiery ball flying from the window straight towards the head of the emperor. The ball, it was of lightning, whirled about the floor, then passed the chandelier and it flew out through the door into the park. My heart froze. I glanced at my grandfather. His face was completely calm. He crossed himself just as calmly as he had when the fiery ball had flown near us, and I felt that it was unseemly and not courageous to be frightened. As I was, I felt that one only had to look at what was happening and believe in the mercy of God, as he, my grandfather, did. After the ball had passed through the whole church and suddenly gone out through the door, I again looked at my grandfather. A faint smile was on his face and he nodded his head at me. My panic disappeared and from that time I had no more fear of storms. So this is... Um, the, his, the same man who freed the serfs and then was killed by a revolutionary. So he was, in his own way, he was an extraordinary person. And so the Tsar, there's a whole story of, you know, Alexander II taking, taking over and then um, he was a very intimidating person who um, caused Russia to grow quite a lot in uh, strength and power and industry and whatnot. And, um, but this revolutionaries uh, were trying to kill him too. And so there was a couple of times where they were threw bombs and on one occasion they threw a bomb at the royal family while they were in a train car. And um, Tsar Alexander uh, basically held up the roof of the train car in order to allow his wife and children to leave. And that strain from that was the cause of some internal problem later, where he died, and Tsar Alexander's fa uh, spiritual father was uh, St. John of Kronstadt. And so the royal family was very close to saints and very, very spiritual people. Um, that gets a little lost in the secular histories. Um, so then the Tsar became, uh, Tsar Nic Nicholas became Nicholas II. And under his, uh, guidance, 
The church reached its fullest development and power. The number of churches increased by more than 10,000. There were 57,000 churches by the end of the period. The number of monasteries increased by 250, bringing the total up to 1,025. Ancient churches were renovated. The emperor himself took part in laying the, the cornerstones the cons and the consecration of many churches. Uh, he visited uh, churches and monasteries in all parts of the country, venerating their saints. The emperor stressed the importance of educating the peasant children within the framework of the church, the parish, and as a result, the number of parish schools grew to, to 37,000. And so then there's a list of various um, uh, publications that um, came forth from his influence and, and guidance. And it's important to note that uh, our parish that's in Pennsylvania of St. Peter and Paul, Tsar Nicholas actually um, donated money for that. And um, there was more money set aside, but the revolution ended his ability to support the church. So we even have like a, a church in our uh, lo local parish that was started by him. And that, that parish is uh, consecrated. So, and so that's the czar. And that's um, Grand Duchess Elizabeth, who, who was Saint Elizabeth, whose husband, the Grand Duke Serge, was once again killed by uh, murderous revolutionaries, and then she in 1909, and she became a sister of mercy. It was it was it was um, mostly to help the poor. They had their prayer rule. It wasn't exactly the way Orthodox monasticism was some new thing. And like once she had done this for a while, she wanted to become a, a, a nun. But it, the the um, nurses would wear garb similar to what you see Saint Elizabeth wearing there but it was like white and she had her own sort of version um but if the i unfortunately i don't have any pictures of it but the the um, daughters of saint nicholas during the beginning of the war they were similar garb like that and they would and they even the empress they would take care of the they would go to hospitals and they would help surgeons um would and uh they all knew how to fix wounds and various things like these people were very very compassionate and dedicated to the life in Christ. And so um, it, it, I think it's important for us to know about this. So there was no Tsar whose reign, in whose reign more saints were glorified than of St. Nicholas. His love of orthodoxy and the church's holy ones knew no bounds, as he himself often pressured the Holy Synod to speedily uh, accord fitting reverence to many of God's saints. Among those glorified during his reign were St. Theodosia of Chernigov, St. Isidore Yerev, St. Ephrosinia of Podol, St. Anne of Kashin, St. Joseph Joseph of Belgorod, uh, St. Hermogenes of Moscow, St. Peter of Podol, and St. Uh, John Maximovich of Tobolsk, who was an uh, ancestor of St. John Maximovich in San Francisco, St. Paul of Tobolsk. And in addition to this, uh, the one of the most re revered of Russia, St. St. Seraphim of Sarov, was glorified by the church during the reign of the Pious Tsar in 1903. So there's a this is important. So this is the Tsar in 1903 um, in the procession carrying the holy relics of St. Seraphim. And so at the time, Nicholas was made aware of the future apostasy and downfall of the Russian nation and church through a prophetic letter written by St. Seraphim himself. The saint had, shortly before his death in 1833, written this letter, sealed it with five wax seals, and addressed to it to the Tsar in whose reign I shall be glorified." End quote. Uh, he then gave it to Elena Motovilov, the young wife of N.I. Motovilov, who is now well known for recording his conversation with St. Seraphim about the acquisition of the Holy Spirit. I, and if you haven't read that, ask me to send it to you. It's amazing. And so uh, she kept that letter for 70 years and gave it to the Tsar at the glorification ceremony. While the exact contents are today unknown, it is nevertheless certain that St. Seraphim prepared Nic uh, Nicholas for the coming tribulations. Furthermore, on the return trip from Sarov, the royal family visited St. Seraphim's Divyevo convent, where Blessed Pasha, Padaskeva, the fool for Christ's sake, spoke to them several hours, and it is said that she foretold to them their own martyrdom as well as that of Holy Russia. It is said the Empress was near to fainting and said, I don't believe you, it cannot be. Now this is one year before the birth of the heir to the throne, so it's 1903, <coughs> and they very much wanted an heir, so Blessed Pasha got up from her bed with a piece of red material and said, this is for some little trousers for your son. 
And when he is born, you will believe what I have been telling you. And so they left her cell pale and shaken, but resolute. They would accept with faith whatever God had prepared for them, esteeming the incorruptible crown of martyrdom higher than corruptible earthly crowns, electing to accept the cup of, cup of suffering offered to them by God Almighty, then by drinking of it, that by drinking of it, they might offer themselves up as a sacrifice for their people. So that's the family. There's the Zarevich. This is probably around 1913 or 14. Maybe 14. So after, this is 1917, the abdic after the abdication on March 9th, so I'm jumping ahead now because it's about the story of their cross, really. So the, the Tsar was convinced to abdicate. He actually wrote a, uh, in his abdication, he turned the government over to his son, who's not his son, to his brother. And uh, basically the Duma and the provisional government took over and they mismanaged everything and then the Bolsheviks took over. So it was a, a terrible mistake and catastrophe, but nobody wanted the Tsar, nobody wanted orthodoxy. They were, uh, they saw, there was a lot of the aristocrats saw the Orthodox Church and the monarchy is um, antiquated. And they were infected by certain levels of, uh, I guess, revolutionary ideas. And so after the abdication on March 9, the Tsar arrived back in Tsarskoye Selo, where his family were all under the house arrest like common criminals. And he found all of his children ill. Alexis, Olga, and Maria had the measles and were bedridden with high fevers. Tatiana and Anastasia both had painful ear abscesses. Again, the image of Job overshadowed him. All had been taken from him except his dear ones and his indomitable faith. He did not curse his fate, accepting all as the will of God, and did not even murmur against his captors who treated him with disrespect and even contempt. What greater example could the Russian people have asked for or what nobler man could have led them as their king? Thus Christ's lament over the chosen people was fulfilled in Holy Russia as well. Quote, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and yet you would not. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. And so when they were at Sarskoselo, that was their home before, so then they just moved some men to guard them. And so there were still the court photographer, there were still people around who refused to leave. So this is a picture of them in captivity in their home in Sarskoselo. And so they were you know, just taking care of all the manual work um, themselves. Not only the Tsar, but the whole of his blessed family met their fate with truly Christian patience. Thus on March 13, 1917, the Tsarevis Alexis wrote his sister Anastasia, I will pray fervently for you, Maria. With God, everything will pass. Be patient and pray. And again, uh, and shortly after the abdication, the Empress wrote, quote, our sufferings are nothing. Look at the sufferings of, our sa of the Savior how he suffered for us. If this is necessary for us, we are ready to sacrifice our lives and everything, end quote. And again, quote, I love my country with all its faults. It grows dearer and dearer to me. I feel old, oh, so old, I, but I am still the mother of this country and I suffer its pains and as my own child's pains. And I love it in spite of all its sins and its horror. Since God sent us such trials, evidently he thinks that we are sufficiently prepared for it. It is sort of an ex uh, it is a sort of examination. One can find everything. One can find in everything something good and useful. Whatever sufferings we go through, let it be. He will give us strength and patience, and will not leave us. He is merciful. It is only necessary to bow to his will without murmur and wait. There, on the other side, he is preparing for all who love him indescribable joy. So there's a, a picture, once again, in Sartskoye Selo, where they're doing uh, basically gardening. And there's the Tsar with uh, some soldiers who are guarding him. But then things changed. Uh, the, Sarko, the royal family left Tsarskoye Selo on, August, uh, on, on uh, July 31st. And on August 6th, they arrived in Tobolsk on the ship Rus. As the provisional government began to collapse amidst Bolshevik ravings, many Russians everywhere behaved as though in a trance against their better instincts, or even worse, through, as though possessed. 
The Tsar and his family remained in Tobolsk until the following April, taking comfort only in prayer and each other. And so they were very diligent about the daily services as much as they could do it, and they would go to church as often as they could. Later, they would, wouldn't, were not allowed to go to church. Um, and so their whole life was in the rhythm of the liturgical cycle of the church. And um, they were prayerful before, and they were much more prayerful um, with all these temptations. Um, you know, Dostoevsky wrote a book called The Possessed, or the demons, and he's basically prophesied what happened in Russia. If, if I don't know if any of you knew about that, and so people, he under, you know, Dostoevsky understood the revolutionary spirit and how, in a certain sense, it's just, it's a very demonic, deep-seated um, spirit of basically envy. But I'll, I don't know, enough said about that. Um, so from the letters of Tsar Martyr Nicholas. Quote, I was born on the feast of St. Job, the much suffering. I have more than a presentiment that I am doomed to terrible trials and that I will not be rewarded for them in this world. Again, I have a firm, a absolute conviction that the fate of Russia, that my own fate and that of my family is in the hands of God, who has placed me where I am. Whatever may happen to him, I shall bow to his will with the consciousness of never having had any thought other than of serving the country which he has entrusted me to me. And again, if a sacrifice is needed for the salvation of Russia, then I shall be that sacrifice. May God's will be done. And then from exile in Siberia, the Tsar wrote, I will not permit myself to think that these horrors, disasters, and infamies which now surround us will continue for long. I firmly believe that the Lord will take pity on Russia and calm the passions at long last. May his holy will be done. So the uh, Tsaritsa, uh, Empress Alexandra, wrote a lot. And so uh, I, I want to just quote three paragraphs. She says, quote, I believe in God with all my being. And all that might come to pass will not take away this belief. I do not understand, but I know that he understands and that he is arranging everything for the best. If our reward is not given us here, then it will be in the next world. Here everything passes, but yonder there is a radiant eternity. Everyone needs tribulations, but it is necessary to show forth one's steadfastness in all things and to endure everything with a firmly believing soul. There are no such adversities that shall not. There are no such adversities that shall not pass. Our Lord, in His boundless mercy, has promised, promised us this, and we know what sort of ineffable bliss He has prepared for them that love Him. May He help everyone to bear His holy will with complete submissiveness. The reign of evil is now upon the earth, but He is above all. He is able to turn everything to the better. He whose conscience is clear more easily endures slander and injustices. And so, and now let's quote this one. How is one to live if there is no hope? One must be stout-hearted, and then God will grant peace of soul. It is painful, vexing, offensive, shameful. One is suffering. Everything aches and is pierced through. Yet in one's soul there is tranquility a calm faith and a love for God who will not forsake his own and who will hearken unto the prayers of the zealous and have mercy and save. One must first of all find peace and tranquility within oneself. Then it will be possible to live everywhere in freedom, in bonds. It might, it might be difficult or terrible, but one soul must remain unshaken, strong, deep, firm as a wall. And then I have um, the last quote from her. The Lord God knows why it was necessary to send such trials. He will give everyone who turns to him with faith the strength to endure everything. And yonder there will be, there will be re a reward for everything. There everything will be clear and intelligible to us. Only one must direct one's gaze forward with courage. He is not without mercy. And when it seems that there is no salvation, then he will appear in his glory. One senses the light behind the clouds. 
one knows that the, that the sun is there and that it will shine on us. One must be patient yet a little longer and not murmur and accept everything from his hands, only praying that, praying to be given strength and not to grow weak in faith and hope. After all, he sent his own son to suffer for our salvation. Thus the entire land is suffering and will be saved on account of his inexhaustible love towards us sinful mortals. Everything seems horrible, and so it is, but this is for the purification of our sinful way of life. My soul is at peace. One senses the nearness of God. And so there's a lot of secular uh, writers or historians that they say, oh, it's uh, controversial that the royal martyrs are considered saints. All you have to do is read their, um, their writings. Um, I don't. I don't have any direct quotes, but um, I don't know if any of you are familiar with the letters of Saint John Chrysostom to the Deaconess Olympias. Um, the uh, Empress Alexandra would write whole passages and letters to her friends in order to encourage them, and it was all. They were trained by the fathers. They lived the life of the church. Um, I said in the beginning, there's many ways that we can't relate to how they live because they were, um, um, the emperor and empress of the, the uh, largest empire, there were seven uh, time zones um, on one landmass. It was unbelievably rich in um, resources, but all that was taken away and so then those, those letters give us a window into who they really were. Those letters uh, give us a, 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 an understanding about how they um, embrace the teachings of the, of the church and how Tsar Nicholas was helped in many ways by many spiritual men and just the circumstances of his life. And he accepted this idea that um, he was the embodiment of, of Job in the latter times. So it's, it's a very striking and very clear uh, witness to the sanctity that they eventually attained to, where they were able to forgive their enemies, and then they were martyred. Um, so I could, I could say more. There, in Ekaterinburg, there was three months of psychological torture, um, and they all retain their inward calm in, in state of prayer so that not a small number of their tormentors were softened by these valiant Christian strugglers. As Pierre Gellard, the French tutor of the Zerevich, uh, Alexis recalled, the courage of the prisoners was sustained in a remarkable way by religion. They had kept that wonderful faith which in Tobolsk had been the admiration of their entourage and in which had given them such strength such serenity and suffering. They were already almost entirely detached from this world. The Tsaritsa and the Grand Duchesses could often be heard singing religious airs which affected their guards in spite of themselves. Gradually these guards <clears throat> were humanized by contact with the prisoners. They were astonished at their simplicity, attracted by their gentleness, subdued by their serene dignity, and soon found themselves dominated by those whom they sought, whom they thought they held in their power. The drunken Evdievia found himself disarmed by such greatness of soul that he grew conscious of his own infamy. The early ferocity of these men was succeeded by profound piety. So this is an example of how in the early church, uh, Christian long suffering uh, and, and love converted the pagan world. So perhaps some of these men were converted. And so when this would happen, the inhuman Bolsheviks would replace the guards who had been so touched with the crueler and more animalistic ones. And so, <clears throat> seldom being allowed to go to church, they nevertheless nourished their souls with home prayers and greatly rejoiced at every opportunity to receive the divine sacraments. Three days before their martyrdom, in the very house in which they were imprisoned, there took place the last church service of their suffering lives as the officiating priest, Father John Sorozhev, related. It appeared to me that the emperor and all his daughters too were very tired. During such a service, it is customary to read a prayer for the deceased. 
for some reasons, the deacon began to sing it, and I joined him. And as soon as we started to sing, we heard the imperial family behind us drop to their knees, as it is done during funeral services. Thus they prepared themselves without suspecting it for their own death and accepting the funeral uh, viaticum. Contrary to their custom, none of the family sang during the service, and upon leaving the house, the clergyman expressed the opinion that they appeared different, as if something had happened to them. The Tsaritsa used to say, we are one, and this, alas, is so rare today. We are tightly united, we are tightly united together, a small, tightly knit family. Inseparable in life, they were so now to remain unseparated in death. After midnight on July 4, 17, the entire family with their doctor and two faithful servants were brought to the basement of the house of their confinement under the pretext of moving them once again. There they were brutally and mercilessly murdered, the children as well as the adults, under the cover of darkness. For, quote, men love darkness rather than the light because their deeds were evil, end quote. The Tsar was shot as he stood forward to defend his family. Tsaritsa Alexander was able to make the sign of the cross before she too fell. The first bullets did not bring death to the youngest ones as they were savagely clubbed and bayoneted and, and shot at point blank range. And so to quote St. John of Cronset, he said that Russia without the Tsar would no longer even bear the name of Russia and would be a stinking corpse. And so it proved to be the world of Bolshevism. And so we venerate them. Um, they're modern people, people in our time, people who would have been tempted by material things much more than we because they had more material things. And yet, because they were in close contact with saints, and I mentioned St. John of Cronset and there are others, um, they were drawn to the piety of the church and they were an anomaly amongst the aristocrats. And so um, they shone forth and I, I think they're just a, a really shining example uh, for us. And um, so I conclude my, I conclude my talk.